Hey, Mark, how's it going today? Pretty good, Marcello. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, having this conversation with you. I know we've been kind of working on this in, for a while. Um, I have already seen you present, um, and I just thought that the conversation was really interesting. Um, your kind of viewpoint on brand and brand value from a quant perspective, I think is super interesting. Um, I think you had a ton of really interesting insights around, you know, how do you actually create brand value? What is brand value? Um, and I think that a lot of organizations are still kind of figuring it out. And I think they're sort of starting to build some processes and structure around um, reinforcing brand value. So I thought this would be a really cool discussion. Um, and why don't we kind of just start with, uh, you can just do a quick intro of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Mark Rada. I'm a brand economist at Strata Insights. Um, I am essentially uh, a finance geek at heart, mashed up with a brand strategist. Um, I'm essentially a mutt and, and, I, and I guess that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> I've had the, the pleasure of working with some pretty amazing clients across quite a few industries. Um, I, you know, I really kind of started on this journey uh, by, by first disappointing my parents. <laughs> uh, they were so happy, you know, South Asian parents are so happy when you join engineering right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer, those are the only three options you're allowed. And then, um, you know, I told them that I just wasn't happy in engineering. I wanted to join, join business and, and study business. Uh, but it was like, it was really my passion, right? I really kind of found my calling. I really settled in and, um, and it's been just absolutely fabulous ever since. So did your path, like when you say you studied, you went into business, did your path start in finance? Yeah, you know what? So it actually started in general business. Okay. I didn't really know what I wanted to be like to go into. Mm -hmm. Did HR really appeal to me? Marketing, finance, accounting. And so what I did was I just did some general business courses so that it was applicable, uh, irrespective of which uh, major I would settle into. And, um, and in doing that, I, I quickly realized that, you know, finance, uh, uh, was my thing. I loved numbers. I was terrible at math, but I loved how how connected everything was. But I spent a lot of my uh, my professional credits in university studying economics as well, okay. and then branching out into like behavioral science, psychology, okay, cool. things like that. So, kind of it was finance as the major, but I did a little bit of everything. Well, that's interesting. So how did you kind of find yourself in this brand and economics slash finance world? Yeah, I mean, that was itself. I mean, that itself is quite the journey. Um, I started off um, at, um, you know, working in, um, working in the finance world. Um, I had the pleasure of working with like in, in commercial finance with companies that were uh, startups and mid-sized companies, but high growth. And, and it was amazing because we could really work with the owner operators and the teams as they grew and really structure them for growth um, with debt, equity, whatever that may be, and, and help them really realize this vision of themselves. And, um, and one of the things we always heard was that you know, no one quite understood them, right? Mm -hmm. We're always worth more than what's on our balance sheet or income statement or something like that. That was kind of like the refrain that we always heard. Uh, but it never kind of really meant anything to us other than, no, that's great. I know you think you're worth more, but this is how the world sees you. Then I had the pleasure of jumping ship uh, to Lululemon um, before, uh, you know, it was a public company. And before even private equity was in there. And it was interesting because here was a company that wasn't a cult brand yet, right? But was just growing in the market. And they had a completely different view of value and growth. And it was purely about, you know, community and culture. And those are the two pillars. Um, no marketing, uh, no advertising, 
Uh, but just those two things, community and culture, and investing into that. And, and contrasting that with my finance world, like it really shook me. Right? How can they grow? You know, they're not looking. I mean, yeah, they were managing the balance sheet, but it wasn't in the same way. Right. So Super I got to work with them and, and then jumped to brand finance, doing brand valuations, right? That, that intersection of marketing and finance again. And then from there, kind of jumping ship and starting Strata Insights. And um, yeah, really focusing on brand economics. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I think that comment that you made about um, Lululemon in those early days and how it kind of shook your finance core um, in how their focus was on, I think you said community and- And culture. And culture. Um, I, it's probably still a pretty, um, maybe rare is not the right word, but it's probably still a pretty interesting strategy that uh, you don't really see with a lot of organizations when it comes to where are we going to focus our efforts and our investment? Because uh, I think oftentimes that sort of investment is really defined by, you know, what it looks like on the income statement or balance sheet versus yeah. building some of this goodwill. So I, I just thought that was really interesting and not something that you really hear or see that often. And they really leaned into it, right? I mean, yeah. uh, my role was in culture in, in the GTA. And it was interesting because, I mean, they really invested a lot of time and energy into people, right? And they partnered in the community. And this was a huge departure from other athletic and maybe even athleisure brands who, you know, who spent a lot of their time and energy in creating awareness, right? The, in, in the traditional marketing and advertising way, mm -hmm. right? But for them, it was, let's, let's build up who we are internally, understand ourselves extremely well, the core, the DNA, our personality, um, find our people out there who are going to shop with us and uh, build up our brand equity to a point where it ends up being this competitive moat. And you don't have to compromise on um, price, right? You don't have to go on sale ever. People yeah. will still buy you, <laughs> right? You don't have to, if you go silent in the market and you pull your advertising, people will still buy you because you're not dependent on that media buy. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, was that like a, do you think that was an extension? I mean, since you were there at the stage that you were at, this is probably a question that is just interesting to me, but do you think that was an extension of the founder and his personality or was that like a conscious strategic direction that they set as a group of that size? Um, I mean, I mean, I think that, I mean, Chip was a, was a large personality um, and a large part of the brand. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, what, what he thought and felt really uh, uh, like shaped us. Right. So I think that a lot of it was, was chip. I mean, the things that he was into, he was really into not just like the physical side of maintaining your health, but the emotional side as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So whatever kind of he consumed and read, he would shoot out to absolutely everyone else. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's where that came from. Super interesting. Um, so kind of starting at the basics, how would you define an organization's brand and its value? Yeah. So, you know what, like I've seen so many uh, definitions of brand and, and some are cute and short and some are just uh, long and messy. I prefer the long and messy ones <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly, uh, because it's so um, I mean, it, it's so intangible and it means so many different things to different people. I think that like on the cute and short one, you know, I saw one which was like, which said that it's an intangible uh, concept that helps people identify with the company or individual product service, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just, so it's just a feeling that you get. Um, I think that a lot of people misdefine uh, brand, right. For them, brand is this logo or this trademark, right. Um, it's interesting, logo from a consumer perspective, trademark, if you're coming from a legal perspective, mm -hmm. right? Um, but 
oftentimes that's not it. I mean, organizations, organizations can change their logo and it doesn't automatically change something fundamental about their, about their business, who they are, their experience. People don't just start to say, you know, oh, oh my God, you, you went from one logo to another, take my money. Mm-hmm. Right? That's not brand. Brand has got to be something deeper than that. It's, it's the personality, the attributes, the reputation uh, that you have. And, and I think that there's like a distinction within there itself, which is brand and reputation, right? Even though we use them like uh, synonymously, they're, they're not the same thing, right? Brand is about relevance, right? What you do matters to me. Uh, but rep- reputation is about credibility, you know, this notion that I trust you, mm-hmm. Right. So there's, it's, it's, it's this Rubik's cube. It's messy. It's, there's no, there's no one cute way of approaching it. Yeah. But there's a lot of moving parts that come into it. So it's like trying to describe a person or their personality, right? Mm-hmm. There's so many things that you can touch on that, uh, that helps define them. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, it's definitely pretty nuanced. There's a ton of uh, different variables, I guess, that you know, we look at under what makes a brand. <laughs> Um, there's this, um, there's this interesting visual. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's, it's maybe it was one of the decks I might've shared, but it's, it's, it's essentially, um, a, an ecosystem concept, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, brand is an ecosystem, which is not all that different than the ecosystem of earth. Right. Um, you know, we have things that, enable us to live here on earth and to survive here on earth and great organizations and great brands have the same stuff right and oftentimes the most important stuff are actually invisible right just like the core of the earth for us the magnetic spheres you know the the ozone layer and the different spheres around us organizations have the same thing and all of those things put together the ecology of brand or this organization is is the collective is is how i approach brand mm-hmm. right? it's not one thing it's well how does you know the, the the experience and the packaging the design advertising how does that play but then you have other layers to this which is what about you know culture uh what about your ip portfolio uh distribution you know that secret sauce uh you know that, that makes you guys like just work amazing right that your competition can't can't quite get their hands around you know if we think about amazon amazon's brand is not its logo amazon's brand is it's number one it's it's shopping experience we're talking about amazon marketplace yeah um distribution when i hit buy the next day someone's ringing my doorbell and if i don't feel secure my purchase if i don't get it in within a reasonable time and I can't track it. That's a terrible brand experience. I don't care that its logo is a blue smiley face or an orange smiley face. Yeah. That's one of those concepts that I, I love. Um, and it kind of makes you think about, you know, what does a, br- what does a brand gatekeeper look like? in terms of like a role within an organization in this ideal world where an organization thinks of brand as ecosystem. Is that someone that touches all aspects of the company, including like fulfillment, customer experience, marketing, you know, experiential web experience, app experience. And how does that differ from what most organizations are doing now? Because from what I see and kind of understand is that that whole identity gatekeeper is really focused more on the marketing side versus operations fulfillment and all all that kind of stuff all those ecosystem parts but what do you typically see with organizations that you work with i mean for the most part it's 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 so siloed right Mm -hmm. these titles that we've given have created fiefdoms (laughs) um within within organizations and and no one's allowed to you know, step one foot on someone else's turf because it's it's closely defended. Um, you know, we, we talk about the CMO or we talk about the customer being the most important. And yet you see very little representation of the CMO in 
true decision making at like executive ranks, mm -hmm. right? even though they have an executive title. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, what needs to change is there needs to be an education around how everyone comes together to create brand. Right now, everyone thinks that brand is owned by the CMO, which is completely false, right? Uh, brand is, in fact, a team sport. Everyone comes together in order for the organization to be successful in the market. And so I don't know that there's any one person or one title, but I think that there's like an education that needs to happen, um, especially around like uh, cross-functional KPIs, understanding how sales ties into brand and how marketing ties into brand and their roles and HR and finance and operations, R&D and all these, all these functions come together to create an amazing brand experience. Yeah, so from a brand economics perspective, um, how do you value that? Like, what do you look at and how do you put a number on that? Or do you put a number on that? Like, is brand part of that financial equation? Well, well, you can put a number on it, um, and and that's through uh, brand valuation, right? Right. It's like understanding how how much is this brand worth, right? And how much is it contributing to revenues? I think I think you can do that. Um, it's it's a well established field, and there's leaders in that field. Um, but what excites me more is figuring out. Uh, what are the components that actually drive value within the organization? Mm -hmm. And value doesn't always have to be um, size related in terms of the value of a brand, right? Are you a $10 billion brand? Are you a trillion dollar brand? Yeah, you know, yeah, size matters in some cases, but, you know, the strength of that brand, I think probably matters a bit more. Right. So being able to identify what actually creates value around brand strength is what excites me and being able to position based on that to ensure that you can grow whatever that impact thing may be. Maybe it's revenues. Maybe it's you want to decline cost of capital. Maybe it's you want to drive volunteerism within an organization. Right. Drive impact in some way. Um, that's how I kind of look at uh, value generation. It's not always about top line numbers that's interesting can you can you give an example like can you go into a, maybe like a non-identified case study or example of a, a fake organization that would be coming to you to do this kind of work yeah so um we once had an organization that approached us to say um we want to um have this sponsorship. We want to invest in the sponsorship. And, and for the most part, every time someone wants to invest in the sponsorship, it's there to drive revenue mm -hmm. in some way, right? It's to wine and dine prospects or great customers or, or clients, whoever that may be. And it's usually a revenue uh, facing activity, right? And oftentimes it's owned by sales, right? Sales wants that uh, sponsorship in there. Right. Um, but what was interesting about this is that we were able to actually position the, the investment in the sponsorship uh, to actually drive engagement within the organization and have it inward facing uh, to say that there's actually greater value if you position the sponsorship relative to your employees and those are the targets of the sponsorship. And so they partnered with this other organization, they sponsored them, it was a sporting event, uh, but completely designed to increase engagement and volunteerism. Um, and it was just one, one aspect, one you know, straw in the, I'm satisfied in my role, in my job, I love my company uh, type of thing. Uh, and it was incredibly successful. It was mm -hmm. a very uh, expensive sponsorship. I don't know uh, that I would have necessarily gone there uh, on my own, but how the how it was deployed um, for impact purposes, um, I think you know created a lot more brand love internally 
first, and that you know uh, spills out externally, right? Your number one advocates for your brand are typically your employees, right? We always kind of call them your your employees are your canary canary in the coal mine, right? If you if you have a great culture, if you have a toxic culture. Um, that's the signal to the market, right? Because it oftentimes spills out. Then, you, then the, the eventual effect of that, the long tail effect of that will be lost other partnerships, uh, eroding revenues, yeah. right? Um, probably, slowly, probably some turnover as well. <laughs> turnover, exactly. Things like that. So uh, being able to uh, redefine impact and value from revenue to um, something that a lot of people wouldn't have thought about is is just one example of how you can how you can do this. Yeah, that's and if you were to measure that from a brand value perspective, your 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 value didn't go up, right? Mm-hmm. That's the problem because brand value is a function of revenue generation and the attribution of your trademark and how people feel about your brand in revenue generation. So that includes cost of capital, risk rates, country risk, all these things. And your brand value can increase one day because one of the risk rates changed. But you did nothing in the market that was different, mm-hmm. right? So um, or, your, or your value can decline radically because of one of these things. And so that's why, you know, the focus for me isn't that number. It's about how do we redefine impact? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, and going back to that kind of ecosystem model, um, and KPIs and helping drive brand value within an organization, if an organization was typically siloed, um, how do you align people and how do you create these KPIs to support brand value? Like, where do you start? How do you begin that process? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's typically rooted in, um, in, a lot of, in a lot of data, right? We want to definitely go ahead and do some research, both internally and externally, um, so that the organization has a great understanding of how do people feel about you, number one, right? Um, and we're also able to figure out with that, how should you position in the market? And, 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 and the beauty of that is we're now removing all of the internal biases around who's the leader in this, who takes charge, who plays a supporting role, things like that. This is where egos and silos and fiefdoms and these, uh, they're almost like warlords, right? Uh, some of these, some of these uh, organizations mm-hmm. and, and, and divisions. And so once you understand how you can generate value in the market, right? A playbook is defined. You can actually start to show who owns that. For example, if it's around, you know, great customer experience, um, oftentimes marketing can't own that. Mm -hmm. That's a KPI that has got to be owned by customer care, right? And marketing uh, and operations play very important supporting roles within that, right? So all of a sudden there's a, you know, to this one KPI, which might be around great customer care, great customer service. um, You have an owner of that KPI and you have supporting uh, personnel to that, right? Key supporting players to that. In the same way, it's about, you know, we are, we are, you know, uh, focused on your future. We're thought leaders, things like that. Marketing can own that mm-hmm. typically, um, but there has to be support and follow through from other departments like R&D, right? To show that, hey, we're not just saying we're futuristic, but look at what we're actually developing here uh, to support this KPI and to support our claim in the market. So if you start to kind of break it down in that way, you start to create this like spider web. And you know that if you, if you compromise one or two areas in a spider web, it starts to fall apart. Mm-hmm. That's how organizations are, but people don't realize that. So they inadvertently start to snip away and compromise the integrity of the company. So if we can show that, we start to create more powerful brands. Actually focus and shine a spotlight on the connections. 
where someone leads and where someone supports. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think, you know, when we are often involved with digital products, which are potentially sometimes net new um, business models, revenue generating streams, often um, organizations are kind of surprised that we're asking a lot of questions about the rest of the organization. Um, and I think this whole concept of, you know, the spider web of a brand experience is really important because as an organization, if you invest in this shiny new product or service, especially with technology, you can build anything, whether it's internal, external, and that experience also doesn't match the rest of the organization. Um, there's a whole bunch of brand uh, erosion that happens there as well. Um, so I, I love that concept of like this, this web or brand ecosystem and whatever you're doing over here should still connect to the rest of those pieces and you should continue managing and maintaining that ecosystem through its lifespan. Um, this idea of like Absolutely. having having KPIs per departments and then having, and you didn't recommend this, but I would imagine that, you know, having those departments, department needs um, meet often to, to talk about what are the KPIs, how are we supporting brand from an operations, R&D, marketing, sales perspective, you know, what are you doing over there that can support brand on this side of the ecosystem or, or the puzzle? And how do we kind of reinforce those, those individual strands in the spider web? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great recommendation. Uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, shared KPIs, mm -hmm. right? how you input into this KPI um, mm -hmm. and what does it actually mean? Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people get defensive about that because uh, what we've done is we've incentivized individualistic KPIs, right? right? Right. And so what happens is when you have a win, it's your win. When you have a loss, it's never your loss, right? It's someone else's loss, right? It, mm -hmm. the, the classic, you win a client, sales is like, that was us. You lose a client, marketing didn't do its job. Yeah, yeah. Right. Totally forgetting that this is, you know, a completely shared KPI. Um, and and both parties input into this. And maybe it had nothing to do with sales or marketing, but there was a third or a fourth department that was involved here that kind of dropped the ball on this. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, do you go as far as actually um, positioning companies for sale or looking at that financial impact and saying like, okay, this is the formula for putting a dollar value on how strong your brand is based on all these separate components. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is possible to do that. And, and especially when you're, if you're talking about um, smaller organizations, I think that, um, you know, that's the thing that a lot of people don't look at or they underestimate the importance of brand and defining your brand in that. Um, we've seen um, smaller companies where, you know, when they come for sale, again, this is the whole, am I worth what's shown on my balance sheet? Yeah. Right. And oftentimes it's no, you're not, right. Yeah. You're probably worth more than that. Your, your, your biggest shortfall is you're not able to articulate what that is because mm -hmm. culture isn't found on a balance sheet. Yeah. Right. Engagement isn't found on a balance sheet. Right. You know, cult and by the way, the only place culture shows up is in team building expenses. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> it's an expense. It's not something that you invest into and it creates value and that you can tap into that and monetize and legally protect it. Yeah, that's right? so true too. Because if you're comparing company A and company B, same industry, uh, similar service, similar product, but company A has an amazing work culture, highly engaged workforce that is never represented on any sort of <laughs> financials other than probably that company's performing better. But um, that's a great point. And how the heck do you, how, the, how do you value that? Is, is that something that even happens? Like to- you, 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 can, you can value that. I mean, I think the finance world already does in okay. some way, because if you look at some of the transactions that you have in the market, mm -hmm. um, you know, they far outstrip both the tangible value of, of the company. Um, and there's just like this incredibly large goodwill portion, right? 
right? Which yeah. is which is in there. And 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 they use the word goodwill because they don't always parse out what is that goodwill. Well, how much of that is culture and how much of that is engagement? How much of that is, you know, um, the trademarks, uh, like the, the the logo, the affinity that's there, uh, the reputation of the organization, right? They they know that they're paying more. Uh, for the company because some of that exists, but they're just not able to parse it through. Um, but I think organizations are able to actually start to understand what that is. And that's, you know, through, uh, through some external research, mm-hmm. figuring out uh, why people actually engage with you and being able to call that out, um, you know, say that, hey, we have great customer service. Here's how we index against someone else. This is why we're worth more. You don't see that in our balance sheet, uh, but this is how we actually invest into our brand and, uh, and can do more, uh, more revenue or better margin than our closest competitor. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. So just to reiterate that, so organizations are uh, pairing that financial data with some market research indexed against other organizations in the industry and saying, you know, this is why we think we deserve whatever percent more because here's how we index against other competitors on like customer service or satisfaction and then using that as a negotiating point basically yeah and you can figure out how much of that is truly monetizable right um because you see the the one thing we have to remember is that the the current yardstick that we have for measurement is gap Right. If you're North America, it's yeah. a gap. You generally accepted accounting principles. And in, 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 the, in Europe, you have, you know, IFRS and things like that. Mm-hmm. But you have to under, also understand that, you know, accounting, um, I joke when I say this, but I kind of, I'm serious. It's archaic, right? Because <laughs> it can't account for the things that generate value today in this largely intangible world that we live in, right? Uh, before it used to be property, plant, and equipment that j- were, the core generators of value today it's not it's data yeah. it's reputation you know things like that and so um uh, you know culture engagement thing you know um that's what's generating value accounting can't measure that and that's why you need new tools to measure uh value creation uh and competitive advantage so that's where kind of brand economics comes in to be able to kind of measure these new things in this new intangible based economy. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, in terms of, yeah, this whole intangible economy or the kind of increasing digital economy and maybe digital is not going to affect all industries in the same way. Um, some will probably not need as much digital investment but let's say for the most organizations digital investment is increasing especially after um, COVID and physical distancing and a lot of organizations realizing that they're just kind of late to the game in terms of digital investment does that as people bring on more um, digital strategy does that change the way you look at brand economics um, or does that just become another kind of slice in the digital ecosystem? And, you know, we need to just further expand those teams and those KPIs and continue having some central way of managing and monitoring those KPIs to help build brand. Yeah. I mean, I think that like the digital world is important, right? Um, we, we often get sucked into an overly digital world, right? Where we forget everything else. We're digital at the cost of everything else. All these like non-digital touch points, which are still immense creators of value and and engagement and and generate unbelievable amounts of brand equity. Um, Mm -hmm. And and there's actually like, there's there's like, there's four parts of this. There's, There's... essentially four pies. The first pie is your digital world, right? Anything that you could do in the digital space. And, you know, social media, like, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, whatever that you're in. 
And then there's a pie, that entire digital pie is just one slice of a media mix pie, right? And that media mix pie includes um, things that are outside of the digital world, includes radio, billboards, right? You know, the classic out of home um, and other, other functions of media, mm -hmm. television. And that entire media mix pie is just one slice of a marketing mix, mm -hmm. right? Which includes, uh, you know, PR, um, you know, and, and, and other elements of the marketing mix itself. But all of that stuff is just one slice of your brand mix, right? Your entire brand mix model itself. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's focusing just on the digital side and they've got these great uh, models and, you know, some of them are like the, the Romy models, right? Return on marketing investment, things like that, are, are ignoring that that's just one slice of a much larger pie, right? For sure. Which is the entire brand and brand experience mix. Yeah. To kind of complicate your, your ecosystem one step further, I think that... Um, from a marketing perspective, that all makes sense. To add another layer of complexity, I feel like when you're uh, getting into digital and creating a product service or any sort of building any sort of digital efficiency application, internally focused or externally focused, it's almost like duplicating that ecosystem because now you're starting potentially a whole business line and it's not enough to just say and I, I think this totally ties in with the whole brand economics concept it's not enough to just say uh you know we're gonna we're gonna start an e-commerce store okay great yeah that sounds awesome probably a good fit um for most organizations that feel like that's the way they need to go how are you supporting this like what happens if as a, as a customer, I order something, I got the wrong product or I'm not happy with the product and I want to return it. Do you have staff that are trained to support that? Do you even have those people at all? Or, you know, you launch a new, this happens quite often to us actually, organizations want to do something digital. Um, and I find that the problem usually uh, is most often attached to something that's revenue generating. I mean, we want to launch a new app that uh, we're going to now deliver our service or product digitally. Um, okay, well, you also have salespeople. Um, are, you, are the salespeople going to help drive that? And how are they going to drive that? Have they been trained? Um, oftentimes, that hasn't even been considered. It's just, let's go digital. Let's design and build this digital thing. And then, you know, a year later, it's not performing to the same degree that it should perform. And you start to hear that, you know, salespeople are not leveraging it. Operations doesn't know how to use it properly. Um, no one's been brought into the kind of that ecosystem. So I just think that, that organizations should have like a cheat sheet ecosystem <laughs> infograph infographic right on their de desk and anytime a new digital product is is being introduced or or being talked about um which is great because a lot of ambitious organizations have tons of these ideas that organizations should refer back to this ecosystem and ask the questions how are we supporting it how are we growing it how are we consistently keeping the customer experience as high as the rest of the organization and how are we making it seamless for, for those end users? Because I think sometimes those questions are missed uh, and it's full speed ahead. Uh, and, and oftentimes when that happens, we have to give some bad news and say like, okay, well, we're not gonna do this project because it's not gonna be successful because you haven't thought about all these other pieces to help support it after it actually launches. Yeah, I mean, that's a great example of, mm -hmm. of essentially that team sport mentality for brand, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, because it really does take a village or a team or, you know, I think I've joked about like LeBron before, right? Um, he, LeBron's LeBron, 
not, I mean, he's got great skills, but there's a team around him to support him. And if you changed anything about any one of those things, or you changed the schedule, you added more games or whatever, there's a ripple effect felt around the ecosystem that supports him, mm-hmm. right, to be successful. Um, and, and yeah, if you don't have that, if you, if you haven't thought through that, or if people aren't in tune with it, right, um, or think about it in that way, someone's going to drop the ball and there's going to be huge consequences. Um, United Airlines was a, we use this as a great example uh, for that, which is, you know, remember, do you remember that whole um, overbooking the flight incident? Yes. They ended up like forcing that, that guy off the plane. They essentially like beat him up, right? Yeah, yeah. That was just and, so crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, but you know what? Like, I mean, United Airlines had Fly the Friendly Skies. Great marketing campaign for a long time. They were doing, they were so, literally soaring, pun intended. Um, <laughs> and, and, and they're doing well, but then it's like, oh yeah, you know, there's this thing called overbooking ops might be like, oh, statistically speaking, you know, uh, it works out in our favor and finances like judging, we get to make more money and legal's like, oh yeah, let's, you know, write, scribble something in, in the fine print and, you know, protect us. But when it comes to rolling out the experience and when the rubber hits the road, you know, and what happens when there is an overbooking, right? You haven't thought that through Mm -hmm. and uh, someone gets, someone doesn't want to get off the plane. Well, you drag them off. You know, the consequence (laughs) was $900 million of market capitalization dumped within 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 24 hours wow that's wild right and 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 of course you can build that back up right the capital markets are its own thing and of course you can build up some of that again but you know you do end up suffering in terms of consideration you know the long-term effect on 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 bookings people are a little bit like edgy and saying well i don't know if i want to take united airlines Right. I might be knocked off and they might consider Delta or Southwest instead. Right. Because you're not going to have five airlines in your consideration set. Yeah. Right. So it was just like one thing that has a ripple effect and touches all aspects and all functions within an organization. Yeah. You, the airline industry is a funny one because there's just so many problem areas with most of them. I had an awful United experience actually once and, uh, it was way after this incident and uh, basically like our flight got canceled. It was a work trip. We were, we were in the middle of nowhere um, in the U S and um, we were given a, a phone number basically to, to call, to get some sort of uh, booking for a hotel because we were stranded. It was like midnight. Call the number. No one answers. Call the number. No one answers. Look up the organization and the better business bureau and basically it was like it was like bankrupt it didn't even exist so they gave us this phone number to an organization that i guess was a third party that helping help help them support you know these issues and the company basically didn't even exist so we ended up having to like find our way around and anyways it was just like such a crazy incident and some org- it's like some honestly some organizations can get away with it because of the in- inelasticity of that good or service, mm-hmm. right? Because you have to use it. Yeah, to know totally. They, could, they get get away, but given the choice, given the dollars in that person's pocket, they might. I'll guarantee you, they'll vote with their dollars in a very different way. Right? For sure. If they had choice. For sure. The other thing that I've noticed is, especially you know, from a digital and user experience perspective, it's like you t- all it takes is one competitor in that space to actually start investing in that customer or user experience and they shoot ahead of the competition for a short period of time until everyone starts panicking and trying to catch up Um, and that i find in some industries like the airline industry that's often the only way that everyone moves in a a direction of improvement uh from a customer and digital uh perspective absolutely um Okay, so what if uh, an organization wants to start making a change? Uh, they've never thought about um, brand economics or the brand ecosystem. They haven't really defined 
if they are have a great brand ecosystem, ton of brand value or not, um, what's kind of like step one to steering the ship in that direction? I think step one is to remove um, this notion of uh, brand value, number one. Mm-hmm. Right. Don't don't look at the size of, you know, another brand and and, and compare yourself or have expectations around that, uh, because uh, you can have and you can build cult brands that don't have high brand value. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And it can be you could you could serve a very niche portion of the population and have unbelievable like revenue or margin engagement, whatever that may be. Think about like you know, Ferrari or, or, or um, Harley Davidson, you know, they're not for everybody. Harley's not for everybody, right? They'll never just continuously pump out bikes. Yeah. Right. Uh, but their impact and, and their, their brand equity and how, how much of a cult brand they are is, is truly unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So focus on the brand equity and the brand strength side of the equation, erase brand value from it. Eventually you can build brand value, right? But that, that equity is in the short term and the long term, actually the most monetizable thing. So the first thing I would do is um, probably just go and survey internally. Remember uh, your employees are canaries in the coal mine, <laughs> right? Management often has a, a view of um, the brand, how great they are, things like that. But go and actually talk to your, your, your staff. You know, where do you think we're doing great? Uh, what could be improved? Where do you think we're generating value? You know, what do you think our core pillars of our brand are? Right? What's our DNA? Right? Because it really does come down to knowing yourself better. Right? Mm-hmm. And if you know yourself better, you fundamentally understand it. Finding your customer base is going to be that much easier. Right? Cause you just put yourself out there in a very authentic way and people resonate with that. So go talk to your, the people who live out your, your attributes and DNA every day. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the cheapest thing you can do. You don't have to pay for sample, right? You don't even have to incentivize. They would be more than happy to answer that. And then contrast that with, you know, what does management think and feel? Um, and, 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 and look at what the similarities or differences are. I would yeah. then loop in other parts of your ecosystem. What does your suppliers think? What do your clients think? Right um, mm-hmm. about about you, about other organizations. Now, this is a great way to establish an unbiased view of who you are. Because where you can take that next is start to extend that into why do people buy and why do people consume. Right, um, and and where do you fit in that, in that um, in that continuum? For example, like the Starbucks uh, coffee example. You know, if you go to Starbucks or wherever you go to buy, part of the reason why you 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 purchase is you might be thirsty, you need to wake up, you want a coffee, you want a Starbucks coffee, right? And then so what happens is you're able to start to figure out. How are people purchasing? Why do they purchase in the category agnostic of any brand? And look at what they're prioritizing and then figure out and contrast that with uh, what your staff said and what your uh, suppliers said and your past clients said. Do you match? Do you meet those expectations in the market? And if you do, great, continue to do that. And that's going to start to build brand equity. Eventually, that'll build brand value. That's some great advice. That is very actionable. Um, And I think, uh, yeah, if organizations went through that exercise, like you said, it's inexpensive and the amount of value you get out of that is, uh, yeah, it's great. And you can start to kind of work on that positioning and and changing your brand value, basically. (laughs) Yeah, you, you, you will grow. And, and more importantly, you'll, you'll have, a, I think, a, a better understanding of what's driving value, mm-hmm. right? What, what, did, what did people appreciate about you? And then invest your, your time and energy and your resources into those things to continuously drive value. 
And yeah. then at the end of the day, people are willing to pay anything, right? Price what you pay value what you get. Because if they're extracting more value than what they paid for or perceived value, now you're building your revenues, mm-hmm. right? Better engagement, lower churn. Now you're building your, uh, your profit base. Yeah, that is, that's a great advice. Um, yeah, I think a lot of organizations will find that useful. I think maybe we should call it on a, on a high note because that was a great way to, to kind of end this conversation. Um, and yeah, maybe we can put together a little cheat sheet to kind of follow this conversation and, um, and organizations can kind of use that in their decision making. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, That was really, uh, really great. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks, Marcello.